Recombinant DNA technology is uh, the technology that's used by genetic engineers every day um, in order to be able to insert synthetic DNA into an organism by using a variety of different tools and um, operations in order to be able to do so. So right here on the right, I have kind of drawn a genetic engineer's toolbox. You'll see that I've included restriction enzymes, which I've talked about in previous videos. And if you haven't seen those videos or don't know what restriction enzymes are, I encourage you to watch that right now. DNA ligase, which I will touch briefly on right now, and cloning vectors. So DNA ligase, if you'll remember from my restriction enzymes video, if we look at a DNA molecule, say this is a double-stranded molecule here, and on this side we have the short and the long. So this has been cut by a restriction enzyme and you have these sticky ends here and you want these two things to come together and form one molecule, right? But how do these ends, these two three prime overhang ends, actually stick together um, and form this new, um, new double-stranded DNA molecule? DNA ligase is an enzyme that can come in and uh, catalyze a phosphodiester bond between two, um, two ends of the three prime, uh, three prime sticky end, uh, five prime sticky end, and then you have your new single strand or double stranded um, DNA molecule here. So that is what DNA ligase does. Next is the cloning vector. So once they have identified what restriction enzymes they want to use, where they want to cut and where they want it to seal, they will use a, a cloning vector. So a cloning vector is um, a, uh, it basically, it fools the bacterial host, commonly used um, is E. coli, into replicating the foreign, foreign DNA fragment, which is the fragment that the scientists have injected into the uh, plasmid. So a plasmid is just a circle, circular DNA like this. And you'll remember from my other videos that there's different cut sites that the restriction enzymes can make. And there's a bunch of different types of cloning vectors, not just plasmids. So there's plasmids. I'll just write this up here. There are plasmids. Um, there are bacteriophages, cosmids. Um, TI plasmid shuttle vectors. There's a bunch of different cloning vectors that scientists are able to use. Um, a lot of these aren't usually used as cloning vectors, um, like TI plasmids and P elements and DNA viruses like the SV40. Um, so those are more used for, um, uh, used as vehicles to transform eukaryotic cells after the cloning of E. coli. So plasmid DNA is usually Let's draw this over here. So plasmid DNA is usually about 20 to 40 copies per cell that replicate autonomously. Um, they contain only a few genes and the host chromosome contains about 10,000 genes that are essential for growth and cell division. So plasmid cloning vectors, they occur naturally in microorganisms. So we can write that down. Um, micro or Organisms, um, so like bacteria and some yeast, um, they're constructed for recombinant DNA technology. Um, an example of that would be the BR322 plasmid. Um, they are stably inherited in an extra chromosomal state, so like a autonomous replication of the DNA molecule. They frequently carry genes that confer antibiotic resistance on the bacterial host, which is important. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, they possess unique restriction endonuclease recognition sequences that are employed as cloning or insertion sites for foreign DNA. And they vary in size from 1 to 200 kilobase pairs, but for cloning, plasmid vectors are pretty small and they're usually less than 6 kilobase pairs. Oops, let's say G6. Okay, so if we were to draw a uh, plasmid here, and let's pretend we have an eco-R1 eco cut site there, a 
S A L S A two cutsite there, and a P S T one cutsite right here. And I'm not going to write those actually down, but I am going to draw right here in this section. We are uh, let's pretend mm, think of an anti oh, tetracycline resistance. So tetracycline resistant and in this section right here so not including this cut site we are ampicillin resistant and let's pretend that this area right here is your origin of replication so you can see here we have a cut site that's not involved in the tetracycline or the ampicillin resistance so if you wanted to insert a piece of foreign DNA into this plasmid and see what happens after you insert it into a bacterial host, you would try to target, let's pretend that this is the eco, or, hold on a second, eco R1 cut site. And this, let's pretend it's a um, SA2 cut site, and this one is a PST1 cut site. So if you were to insert your DNA on the PS2, or PS1, sorry, cut site right here, that is ampicillin resistant, it would no longer be ampicillin resistant. So if you were to put it in a dish and we had a bunch of um, molecules or little bacterial cells here that you injected into all of the plasmids or bacterial cells that took up the plasmids with this no longer ampicillin resistant um, gene sequence if you put ampicillin into this those ones would all die and the rest would live because tetracycline uh, well, the rest, sorry, all of the ampicillin resistant genes uh, would die, so you wouldn't have any cells left. And if you were to insert it in here, same thing would happen if you were to bathe the uh, cells in tetracycline. But if you were to insert it into the Eco R1 site right here, and then bathe it in tetracycline and ampicillin, you would see that some of the cells would die, so you'd have some death. But you'd also have a few cells, or cell colonies, that took up the plasmid with this resistance, and they lived. So that's how antibiotics play a role. So antibiotics are just drugs that specifically inhibit a meta uh, metabolic process to impede growth or kill bacterial cells, but they don't attack human cells at all. So they can be used for the... Um, insertion of a synthetic DNA or foreign DNA into a plasmid. So if you looked at the result of the three types of cells that follow after inserting them with uh, the plasmids, you would see that some of them have no plasmids at all, so they didn't take any plasmids up, so there's none. And then you'd have some that just resealed without inserting this new um, synthetic DNA, and then you'd have some that are recumbent DNA, which is exactly what we are talking about here, that have taken up your synthetic DNA, so your experiment was a success.